Welcome everyone to week one of uh, semester two. Um, things are going to run pretty much the same. It's good to have you all back. CS Particles has returned new and improved with our friends Jane and Jaina. Sorry, Jane Am and Jane Nil. I should really be able to pronounce that. Uh, so give them a warm welcome. They'll be uh, taking you through some parts of physiology and clinical skills today. Um, and so you, you'll have a chance to, to get to know them. So in terms of how things are going to run this term, it's going to be pretty much the same as last term um, with a few exceptions. So obviously we've got our new presenters. Um, we've also set up a curious chat, um, which is just a site online where you guys can ask questions anonymously um, and we can sort of see them um, and publicly and answer them. Um, so feel free to ask your questions there. I know at least one person's already used it, which is awesome. Um, so please feel free to ask um, questions there. The response time might vary a little bit. So obviously it takes time for us to um, spread that amongst ourselves, come up with an answer and post it. Um, but once we do, that should be hopefully a really good resource because um, it'll allow everyone to benefit um, from the question, not just the person who asked it. Um, so yeah, please do direct your questions to us through there and hopefully we'll be able to, to set up something through that. Okie dokie, I think that's about, oh, sorry, one more admin thing. Um, so apparently, according to your ACREP, um, faculty has scheduled your muddiest point lectures um, at about 11 a.m., which conflicts a little bit with our usual time slot. So we'll put up a poll or something um, after this meeting. So supposedly there's not one this week. So we'll put up a poll after this meeting um, to try and um, uh, figure out if we want to keep the same time, move the time, uh, whatever works well for you guys. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for that um, and we'll try and fix out, uh, sorry, fix up a solution that works for everyone. All right, so let's actually dive into it. Anatomy, this is where your anatomy teaching starts to diverge from sort of the piecemeal um, stuff you learned last semester into like full on, this is med school anatomy. Um, and so we're gonna need to learn a few um, more bits of basic terminology, we're going to need to start thinking about anatomy in a more holistic way. Um, and that's what I'll try to take you through today. Um, so we're going to be starting with upper limb. Um, and I'm just going to run through this sort of basic framework. So um, hopefully this will work as sort of an introduction and you can sort of get to know how anatomy works by going through this particular topic. Um, so we'll start with the osteology, i.e. the bones. Um, so, you know, what's the skeletal underpinning of everything we do? Um, this is particularly relevant for upper limb because it's um, a lot of bones and muscles. Um, when you get to other systems later on, um, you'll be dealing with more organs and things like that where this isn't necessarily as relevant. Uh, but for now, the osteology is very important. Um, that includes the joints and the ligaments between bones as well, um, which you hopefully understand a little bit about already. Um, then we have the musculature or the muscles that go and attach to the bones that move the bones. How do they move? Where do they attach? Um, how are they supplied by the body? Um, and supply means the neurovasculature. So your nerves, your arteries, and your veins. Nerves send signals to your muscles, arteries sending blood to your uh, muscles and veins draining, um, in most cases, the oxygenated blood. Uh, but we'll get into that a little bit more um, later on. Lymphatic. Um, lymphatic and spaces are not quite as important, but they are still at least a little bit important. Um, so the lymphatic, obviously, you know, draining, stuff, uh, draining just fluid in general away. Um, the key thing to know probably is lymph nodes. So uh, you've already learned the basics, I believe, of, of lymphatics. Um, so now at this point, we want to learn about lymph nodes and the pathways that lymph take to get back to the central circulation. Um, so that's the important thing to learn there. Spaces is sort of going to be um, a bunch of gaps in the way things move. Um, we'll get a little bit of that today in the form of the axilla, which I'll get to right at the end of my presentation. Um, you'll they're like varying importance of these um, and there's usually more to do with the stuff inside them and the clinical significance than um, the actual spaces themselves. Speaking of clinical significance, big thing. Um, so a lot of your anatomy questions on the exam uh, will be to do with this bit of anatomy that we've just learned. How does that actually translate to um, clinical situations? So what are the risks involved in such and such um, sort of structure? Um, what are likely injuries, that sort of thing. That's all very important. Okie dokie. Um, and yeah, so anatomy can be as deep or as shallow as you want. So we have a limit, we have limited time. We want to try and get this done efficiently. 
And so we're not going to spend um, forever on it. Um, if you want a really in-depth look, the only way to do that um, is to you know, look at your textbooks to go through stuff like that. Um, we'll try to give you a look at the most high yield, the most important stuff. So consider this more of a springboard or a revision tool or, or a, um, a head start on anatomy than like an exhaustive look. Um, we have no guarantee that we'll cover every little thing, um, just the most important stuff basically. All right, with that in mind, let's start off with a few planes and directions and some of the stuff that we need to understand if we want to understand anatomy as a whole. So um, I wanted you to look at the directions first. So that's all those little arrows going around over here. Um, these are gonna be the most important ones um, for how we start talking about anatomy. Um, it doesn't matter if you don't get these immediately, um, but you do need to learn them eventually because they just get used all the time. Um, they'll become the vocabulary with which you, you um, describe the body in general. So in basic terms, up is superior, down is inferior. Um, so that's fairly simple, I would hope. Lateral is further out from the body, medial is further in. So it's not left or right per se, we sort of stop using left or right uh, as much. Instead, we talk about lateral is further out from the midline of your body, medial is closer to the midline of your body, all right? Um, we have another term as well. So we I talked about up and down. We have another term um, called proximal and distal. And that's to do with basically the distance from your central body. Um, so this is most important when it comes to um, your limb, for example. So if I've got my arm out here, I'd say this is more proximal. So it's closer to my you know, central body head, whatever. Um, that's more distal. That's the basic idea. Um, the planes are a little bit more abstract, so you might not necessarily need to know uh, those um, immediately, but they are important for imaging, uh, which we'll get into later on. So that's, you know, x-rays and stuff like that often use these planes as a sort of framework for how they look at your body. One term I did forget to mention just then, um, so forward, anterior, backward, posterior. Uh, that's not on this, uh, I don't think that's on this diagram, but that's another one that you'll see. Um, yeah. Don't worry again, um, these terms will come up again and again and again, so you will probably end up getting them just by like doing the anatomy, even if you don't get them straight away. Okie dokie. But yeah, so the planes, like I said, not as important, but if you want to know, um, coronal is sort of across your body. So imagine if you like, it's an asymmetrical cut. So you're cutting the front of you, anterior side, versus the back of you, posterior side. Sagittal cuts you down the middle, so um, you're right and left. Um, and transverse cuts you through the middle, but like through the waist almost. So superior versus inferior. All right, um, terminology. So um, we're gonna be talking a lot about muscles today because like I said, um, the upper limb has a lot of muscles in it. Um, and so they're quite important to how everything works. Um, so the attachment uh, of a muscle is considered, so each muscle has at least two attachments. Some of them have more, which we'll see. Um, but that's basically where a muscle connects to a bone because the muscle, or at least the type of muscle we'll be talking about today, um, known as uh, skeletal muscle, is um, basically attached to one bone and it moves another bone. That's the general idea. So we say the origin is the attachment of the muscle to the bone that stays still um, during contraction. You'll be able to see this when I actually go through the muscles and we see how it works. Um, the insertion of a muscle is the attachment on the bone that moves during the contraction. So origin is like where it pulls from and insertion is where it pulls. So remember that muscles can only pull. Um, so everything they do has to be understood um, through that lens. Um, superficial means closer to the outside, deep means closer to the inside. So you can imagine yourself as sort of like a big onion. Uh, the deep layers are the ones closer in, the superficial are the ones closer out. Um, Bony landmarks, so I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of bones. Bony landmarks are just like notable features there. So little raised bits, little grooves, all sorts of stuff. Um, I'm going to occasionally use abbreviations like A, M, and N. Um, that just, sorry, I don't know why that's M. A, V, and N um, for arteries, veins, and nerves, respectively. Um, and I, I think that's M because I also use M for muscle at some point. I'll fix that after this. Um, yeah, so the uh, somebody asked in chat, my, is my video off? Um, I've got a separate account 
on my computer recording my video. So have a look at that if you want to see me as I talk. Okie dokie, upper limb one. So let's get started. So osteology of the shoulder, this is the bone. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, hopefully you can still hear me again, pumping audio through <laughs> all sorts of places. Um, so yeah, your arm, if you think about it, your arm is not actually directly um, linked to the rib cage. So if you think of your torso, your arm doesn't just join at the shoulder to your rib cage and then move from there. Um, it kind of makes sense if you move your arm because you can move it a lot more than you would expect um, if you joined it directly to your torso. So instead, your arm is in what we call the pectoral girdle, okay? Um, so it's a um, whole big socket for the arm, which is actually able to move around the rib cage. So it's sort of a big swivel that glides over the rib cage and allows you to move your arm in all sorts of crazy directions. Um, the only place it's actually connected is actually through your collarbone to your sternum at the front. So if you think about it, that's your entire arm, all of the stuff here, your shoulder bone, it's all connected. If you look up there in the top right of the diagram at that little bit called the sternal end of the clavicle, that's the entire connection um, bone-wise of your arm to your body. So there's not much there. Most of the connection, like most of the stuff that actually keeps your arm in place uh, is muscle. So what that means is that your shoulder joint has a lot of mobility, it can move around a lot, which is good because we need to move our arms a lot. Um, but it does give us a cost in terms of stability. So your shoulder joint um, has wrists involved because it's so mobile. Since we're just focusing on the upper, like the, the again, the pectoral girdle or the shoulder per se, um, at the moment, we're just gonna be focusing on um, the three bones that are listed there. So the clavicle, which is your collarbone, uh, the scapula, your shoulder blade, uh, and the humerus, so your upper arm bone. Um, the humerus is not technically part of the pectoral girdle because the, the girdle is what your arm is in and your humerus is part of the arm, uh, but we're gonna talk about it because it's relevant to a lot of the muscles. Okay, so um, the clavicle, again, your collarbone, that is the connection between your sternum. So, so your sternum is sort of the middle of your, it's like the middle top of your rib cage, basically. Um, so your clavicle is um, basically the connection between that and your shoulder blade up near your shoulder. And we're gonna talk about the joints a bit later on. Um, you can see the curve is sort of almost an S shape. Um, so it curves forward and then it curves backwards a little bit. Uh, sorry, backwards and then forward um, as you move lateral, sorry, medially to laterally. So as you go further away from the center, uh, it goes back and then forward curving around. So the curve sort of shifts and moves in a different direction. Um, and that happens about two thirds down the clavicle. That's gonna be important in a sec. So in terms of important landmarks, obviously you have both ends. So both of them help articulate the clavicle um, with the shoulder blade and the sternum respectively. Um, the actual places on the clavicle, we have the corneate tubercle. You can sort of see, you can, it's only visible in the lower diagram. Um, so you can see that's closer to the lateral end, further out from the body. Um, and that's part of a certain, that, that's the attachment point of a certain ligament. Um, and then we have the trapezoid line, um, which is an attachment point for another ligament. Um, both of those are gonna come up again um, when we talk about the joints. Uh, completely useless trivia. Uh, you can see this little thing uh, called the deltoid tubercle there. Um, the deltoid is a very big muscle, which we'll talk about. I would talk about that as a bony landmark, but there are literally three places in your body which are called the exact same name, the deltoid tubercle. Uh, so it's not a very useful bony landmark. All right, so clinical relevant, relevant, relevant. Um, like I said, it's gonna be important that the two thirds um, sort of shift mean something. And that is the medial two thirds of the clavicle is formed by a different um, type of bone formation than the lateral one third, okay? So the point at which those two join is sort of a little bit weaker and more unstable than the rest of the clavicle. So if you're gonna break the clavicle, it's probably gonna be there. Um, we see a lot of fractures from people who fall onto their shoulder. So they just bang their shoulder or they fall onto an outstretched hand which transmit the force back up their arm and into their collarbone. Um, and we get a, a snap of the clavicle. Um, so remember, these aren't just floating. There's a whole bunch of muscles in place. So because of those muscles, the middle part of the clavicle tends to go up and the lateral part of the clavicle tends to go down um, when we do a fracture. So remember, medial two thirds goes up, lateral one third goes down uh, because of that, that, um, that damage. 
we have a structure called the brachial plexus, which we will talk about in just a second, a lot more detail because it's quite important. Um, and that can be quite, that can be damaged by this. Um, in terms of treatment, we can get surgical or non-surgical means. Um, when we have a fracture like this, we can sometimes end up with um, shoulder separation, which is basically like, you know, um, you start to move your arm and nothing really happens effectively. Um, we'll talk about that also in terms of um, dislocation of certain joints. But keep that in mind. So remember, two thirds, one third, we have a joint there, which is particularly likely to fracture. All right, the scapula. So this is your shoulder blade. Um, it's quite a complex bone. So we're just going to go through bit by bit. Um, so the overall structure of this bone is sort of, it's like a big triangle on your back, basically. Um, there are two important processes, which are just sort of bits of bone which jut out. Um, and we're going to talk about both of those. So the acromion, that's up at the top. You can see it sort of curves around. So it actually faces um, in towards the rest of the body. Um, be clear here. So the one, the, if we look at the top left of this diagram, um, the one where it says like the costal and posterior surface. So costal is looking from the anterior, from the front. Um, posterior surface is looking from the posterior, from the back. Okay. Um, see again, that's posterior um, view. And then lateral view is from the side. So if you're looking at someone's shoulder, this is what you'd see if you could see through the body and see the bone. Um, so you can see the acromion up the top there. It sort of points in back towards the body because that's where the clavicle joins. So you have the clavicle goes out, it joins at that point, and then that sort of wraps around and joins to the rest of the um, the shoulder blade. We have another um, process called the coracoid process. That's just a little one. It sits just above your shoulder joint, your actual socket there, um, and that is the attachment point for certain muscles and also um, for certain ligaments which stabilize the joint. Um, so it's important in that respect. Uh, we have the glenoid fossa. So that's the, the shoulder socket per se. That's the thing that your humerus actually rests in and which your uh, shoulder rotates around. Um, and that's quite a, sort of a relatively shallow um, socket, which we'll talk about the significance of in just a second. Um, and then the spine. So this is not your actual spine. This is the spine of the scapula. You can see it's sort of raised there on the posterior surface of the back. Um, and that forms the acromion at the, the end of it. Um, but it's also an important landmark when we want to differentiate different muscles, basically. Okie dokie. All right, humerus, this is your shoulder bone. So obviously a large bone. I won't actually talk about the entire thing today because we'll be leaving some of that for upper limb two next week when we start talking about more of the arm. For now, we're just going to focus on the bits which are most relevant to um, the shoulder joint. So obviously you've got the head of the humerus, that goes without saying. It's just a big sort of ball, it's a ball and socket joint, um, big ball that sits in the glenoid fossa. The greater tubercle is just a big, again, the tubercle is sort of like a prominence, a bump, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's sort of anterolateral, so forward and to the side. Um, we have a group of muscles called the rotator cuff. Again, so much of this stuff is going to come up later. Don't worry too much about it. Um, and that's where all of those muscles join, except for one called the subscapularis, because that one joins at the lesser tubercle, which is also forward, but a little bit towards the, uh, the middle. Uh, we have something called the intertubercular tubercular groove, because um, anatomists don't like naming things creatively, um, which is helpful for us when we're in the exam. Um, that's literally between the tubercles, um, and there's a, a bicep. One of the heads, bicep literally means two heads, um, so that muscle has two heads. One of the heads um, goes through that little groove there. We have the deltoid tuberosity again. Um, this one's sometimes called the deltoid tubercle. Deltoid tuberosity on your humerus is um, part of the deltoid insertion. So we'll see the deltoid is quite a large muscle. It inserts over quite a large area, uh, but this is part of it. Um, and the last one we'll talk about with the humerus um, is the radial groove. So that's a little sort of corkscrew. It sort of wraps around um, the, the shaft of the bone a little bit. And it carries the radial nerve um, and part of an arc, sorry, part of the artery, um, the deep brachial artery, also known as the spinal death fracture. All right, clinical relevance. So we have two different types of fractures of the humerus that we'll talk about today. There are a lot of different ways to break your arm. Um, so the proximal fracture, so that happens at the surgical neck of the humerus. I'll just come up here. So if you, you've got the anatomical neck, that's like right below the head, and then the surgical neck is underneath the whole sort of bulge at the top. So this usually happens at the surgical neck of the humerus. 
Um, it can be triggered by a full on the output of command. I, you uh, um, pointed out an acronym push for that before. Um, so it can break your collarbone or it can break your arm. Um, or we can also have direct trauma. Um, so you can literally just get a knock on the shoulder somewhere. Um, there's a few different um, structures which pass up here, the axillary nerve and the circumflex arteries, um, both of which supply the deltoids. Um, so when you get a patient who, who's had a fracture which has damaged those structures, um, they may have paralysis of the deltoid and another muscle called teres minor um, because they don't, like, they don't have proper blood supply, they don't have proper nerve supply. Um, and so when they try to move that, the brain's sending signals, but they're not getting through, basically. Um, difficulty of abduction. We'll talk about the movements um, in a little bit. Um, and we've got different names for different things you can do. Abduction is lifting your arms like that, basically. Um, paresthesia, anesthesia, again, little terms. You'll understand these a lot um, more as you go through the uh, term uh, semester. Paresthesia just means change sensation. Um, so you, it feels different, like pins and needles or something. Anesthesia, you can't feel it. So mid shaft fracture, direct trauma, you fall on your arm, you break it, something like that. Um, that radial groove, that stuff wraps around quite close to the bone because it's right in that groove, which means if the bone snaps, um, then there can be a risk of rupturing. Um, so your radial nerve and your profunda brachii artery, um, it presents as something called wrist drop. So if you hold your, your hands out like this, if your wrist drops all the time like that, you find it hard to lift your hands, that's called wrist drop. Um, so we get that um, because of the, the muscles supplied by the radial nerve. Um, and anesthesia through the dorsal hand. So dorsal meaning um, this sort of surface. I forgot to say actually, so um, let me scroll back really quick. B, 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 B. All right. Um, so this position we have here, um, you can see the woman standing here looking straight forward and her palms are sort of forward. That's called the anatomical position. Um, so because your body can move, it doesn't really help if we say, if we say you know, um, your arms are super fit, your hands are superficial to your head because you can lift them, lift them above the head. Um, and so all of our like position um, terms, so when we talk about things in terms of these directions, they're all based on this position called the anatomical position. Um, so if we go back down. Uh, right, yeah. Um, your dorsal hand is the part that faces towards your back um, in the anatomical position. All right, let's talk about the joints. So we have the um, sternoclavicular joint between your sternum, so again, top of your page, um, and your clavicle, your collarbone. Um, so if you actually feel, you can feel sort of the end of your, your collarbone right there. That's part of your sternoclavicular joint. Um, so this is called a plane, this is a sorry, particular type of joint called a planar synovial joint. Um, scary name, very simple once you understand it. So planar just means it's two flat surfaces rubbing against one another. Um, synovial means that there's a joint capsule. So um, that ligament around it, that red ligament, the um, sternoclavicular anterior ligament, that forms a sort of enclosed capsule around the joint, which is filled with fluid. Um, and that fluid is like hydraulic fluid or something in a machine, which makes it easier for the joint to move. Um, so the synovial joint is one filled with fluid, which makes it easier to move. Planar joint um, is one between two flat surfaces. That's it. Um, this is a very mobile joint. Again, you can do a lot of cool stuff um, with your arms. If you feel your, um, your collarbone while you do that, you'll see that it can sort of move quite a bit. Um, but it's really dislocated because it's just a good joint. Um, when it does dislocate, it tends to go um, forward. So like you have a, a pressure on your arm that goes back and it pops the clavicle out forward. It's very rare though. Um, the sternoclavicular joint, this one, it has a, like a, also has a thing called a fibrous disc, um, which you'll hear about more in your lectures probably. Um, and that's again, another sort of um, bit of cushioning in the joint. On the other side of your clavicle, so you know we have our clavicle, we're now going over to the shoulder blade. Um, we join at the acromion process, so that's part of your scapula there. Um, again, that's a planar synovial joint. So it's two flat surfaces, end of the clavicle um, and the acromion. The acromion is a bit rounded, but it's close enough for flat for our purposes. It's also synovial, we have more fluid in there. Um, and there are another three ligaments that support it. So we have the acromioclavicular ligament, um, and then there's another one you can call them together the coracoclavicular ligament um, between the coracoid process and the clavicle. Surprise, surprise. Um, and the two parts of that 
correspond to the two bony landmarks I told about I talked about earlier on the clavicle. Um, so you have your conoid medially closer into your midline and your trapezoid further away from your midline. Um, and so these are this is like very important for your support of your shoulder. Um, so when this joint pops out, so your clomic orbicular sort of just just a, uh, disconnects, um, you get something called shoulder separation. That's not the same thing as shoulder dislocation. Um, because your arm will still be in its socket, but the socket itself will no longer be properly connected to your clavicle. Um, and so when you try to move your arm, it sort of just, just stays there um, and you have like very abortive small movement. Um, so that's what we see in patients who have um, an economy of clavicular dislocation. If you haven't noticed by now, a lot of these are very helpfully named by literally the thing that they are, the things that they're connecting or something like that. So take advantage of that where you can. Uh, makes it a lot easier to remember. So the glenohumeral joint um, is a fancy name for your shoulder joint. Okay, um, this is called a, a so this is a ball and socket synovial joint. So literally, the important thing to understand just here is um, it is a ball, your humerus head ball, uh, and the socket is the glenoid fossa. There's another three ligaments there. They're listed on there. I'm not going to go through them uh, because you can read hopefully. Um, this is highly mobile. So this is a very important thing to understand. So the head of the humerus, it's a big bulbous ball um, and your glenoid fossa is a very shallow um, socket. So it's not a proper socket where you know you can pop it in fully. Um, it actually sits there quite um, shallowly. And so that means you get a lot of mobility. So you can move your arm a lot, but it's more likely to dislocate. So the other thing to compare it to is your hip joint, right? Um, so your legs and arms are actually quite similar um, in, a, in a basic sense, uh, but you get hip dislocations much less commonly than you get arm dislocations. Um, and the trade-off for that is you can move your arm a lot more than you can move your hip. Um, so those are things to understand there. When you do dislocate your arm, you tend to dislocate it anteriorly and inferiorly. So it goes forward and down. Um, uh, Forget, don't worry about the, the movements listed there. You'll understand those when I talk about the movements. Um, and that's just because there's less, um, less support for uh, the bone in that direction. If you look at the lower right diagram, um, there's a bunch of things for bursite. Those are basically little fluid filled sacs um, that again, um, help cushion the joint. So you'll understand there's a whole bunch of um, structures around each joint, which are basically dedicated to um, keeping it moving. Uh, gently and, and smoothly. All right, take a quick break um, because we've gone through a lot of stuff. So then we're going to be talking about the brachial plexus. So we're now moving on to nerves a little bit. Um, we've taken a little quick detour into nerves because before we talk about muscle, um, just because well, muscles are what's supplied by nerves. And so the innervation of a muscle or the nerve which supplies it is quite important. Um, that's both in terms of um, just understanding what each nerve does and the importance of that, but also in a clinical sense, if such and such nerve is damaged, you need to be able to say, um, okay, well, this will have this effect on these muscles. Uh, so that's quite important. Okie dokie. I've got two photos, two, two diagrams here, okay? So the left is a um, more anatomical look at the brachial plexus. Um, the right is a more diagrammatic, so just, me. It's like a subway map, it's just all like sort of simplified. Um, the one on the left is still not accurate to what you will see if you open up a cadaver because you'll expect to see something nice and, and well defined and it'll really just be a bunch of spaghetti, right? It's just a whole bunch of little um, filaments moving together. Um, when you open up a cadaver, it is very hard to differentiate these things. So understand that even when we have a pretty anatomical diagram, they are not necessarily um, true to real life. In life, Everything is a mess, genuinely. Um, and so don't expect to necessarily see this when you, um, when you do it, but this is a good starting point to eventually being able to look at that, that mess and pick out, oh, well, this must be this and that's that, probably that. Um, and a lot of time it will be probably um, for many years to come. Okie dokie. So why do we have the plexus in the first place? So basically you have a whole bunch of nerves coming out your spinal cord. Um, and so those develop quite early in your embryological stage. So you're, you're sitting there in your mom's tummy um, and the nerves are slowly developing, but they're not perfectly um, aligned. So different nerves 
um, from different vertebra there are going to go to different places. So not all of the um, nerves from a certain spinal root um, are going to go to the same area. And so a lot of them will mix together um, into nerves. So um, the roots are basically the little holes in the side of your, your vertebra and, and in the spinal spine in general, um, which allow your spinal cord inside to send nerves out the side. Um, so that's what a spinal root is. We name each root um, for the vertebra above it. So you have the vertebra, C5 vertebra, and then the C5 root comes down like a little bit below it um, because the roots come in like roughly between the vertebra. Um, so those roots come in, they mix into the brachial plexus, and by the time they leave, um, they come out as nerves. So nerves are actually properly segregated by function. So all of the uh, fibers in this nerve will go to this, this, this muscle. Whereas the root fibers coming out of your spinal cord can go to heaps and heaps of little different places, and they all mix together in order to group into like where they're going. Um, so you have a plexus at most of your, your limbs and in other places as well, um, again, because of the same thing. The nerve needs to get from their original organization, which is a little bit haphazard, to more ordered group of, we're doing the same thing, so we're gonna go together, basically. And that's what forms your actual nerve. So the things that you need to understand with the brachial plexus are, is basically this little progression here. Uh, the roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. Uh, note that these two diagrams are facing different ways. So the one on the uh, left here, that's a, a left shoulder looking from the anterior forward. Um, the one on the, the right here, the diagrammatic one, um, if you were looking from the same direction forward, it would be the right shoulder. Uh, it doesn't matter, it's the same stuff either way. So our roots are C5 to T1. So these are named for your vertebra. Um, there's a little exception there in that you have no C8 vertebra, um, but there's a root called um, the, the C8 one. You don't need to worry too much about it. Um, you'll, un you'll, un you'll understand this further on um, as you, you talk more about the roots. Um, but understand basically you have C5 to T1 um, as vertebra in there. Um, and so the roots all come out from there. And then they make three large trunks. The trunk's actually pretty easy to remember, for one, because they're named quite obviously. So superior, again, remember, superior means up, inferior means down. So your superior trunk is, surprise, surprise, the one on the top. Um, inferior is the one below. Middle is the one in the middle. Um, so there you go. This one's also pretty easy to remember because the first two, C5, C6, go into the superior one, the middle one, C7 go to the middle one, uh, and the bottom two, uh, C8 and T1, go into the inferior um, trunk. So that's pretty straightforward. We then have divisions. So each of these trunks has an anterior and a posterior division. Um, and each of them only goes to one place. So again, it's relatively straightforward. Um, so all of the posterior divisions go to the posterior cord, which is the next little bit. Um, so that's, again, pretty straightforward. They all go to the same place. Now, when it comes to the lateral and medial cords, it gets a little bit more complicated. So the lateral cord is named because if you're in the anatomical position, that one is closer to the outside. In the medial position, um, that one, the middle one is closer to the, the inside, the midline of your body. Um, for the purposes of the brachial plexus, because of where it is in the body, lateral and superior, obviously, they're in the same, they're on the same side, um, and medial and inferior are on the same side. So just remember that the trunks are named the, on the up-down directions and the cords are named for the, the left-right direction, basically. Um, the lateral cord is made up of the superior and middle both. So the anterior divisions of those um, trunks go to the lateral cord. Um, the medial cord is only made up of the inferior um, trunk, uh, anterior division, basically. So the branches are where things get a little bit complicated, but you should still be pretty okay um, because we're gonna go through each bit and, and how it forms. So we'll start with the posterior because that's actually um, one of the easier ones because it just has two branches. So um, even though they're all made, they're all like drawn as the same size here, that's not true to real life. So um, in real life, you will see here, the radial nerve is really big. It has a lot of stuff coming from it. Um, and the axillary, like, axillary nerve is a lot smaller. Um, so you can see here on the left, the axillary nerve is sort of curves around. It just supplies the stuff up in the, uh, the shoulder. Um, whereas the radial nerve, it goes on and actually supplies the entire back side of your arm. Um, 
So the radial nerve makes up most of the nerves from there, axillary from the other one. The other three become more easy to understand once I tell you about the median nerve, because the median nerve is the one in the middle. Um, so all of these three, muscular, cutaneous, median, and ulnar, are formed from the lateral and the medial cord. The median nerve is the one in the middle, and if you look at it from sideways, it sort of looks like an M, right? So you've got a little, if you look at only the, uh, the anterior um, stuff, the lateral and medial cord, um, you can see muscular cutaneous is one side of the M, ulnar of the other side of the M, and medium is right at the bottom of the M. So you can look at that, and that actually works a little bit in cadavers as well. Um, if you look at that M shape, the median nerve will be the one coming out through the middle. Um, and from there, the muscular cutaneous one is the one more superior, more lateral, same thing, um, in this situation at least. Um, the ulnar is one which is more inframedial. Okay. We'll learn more about exactly what they do a little bit later, but that's the general idea. Let's keep that. Uh, this is a more complex version of the brachial plexus diagram. So once you're confident with the basics, this one is a good one to talk about, uh, sorry, to, to use. Um, so I won't talk about it too much now because you guys are still um, focusing on learning how it works in the first place. Um, but once you understand that, it can be useful to talk about all these different nerves because a lot of these go and talk about different, go and um, apply different muscles. Um, you can actually come back to this if you want after, after and sort of later. Um, and see how many of the muscles that we talked about, I'm sorry, pretty much all the muscles we talked about, um, with a few exceptions, are going to be supplied by nerves from the brachial plexus. It is genuinely most of your arm um, all comes throughout this one place. So it's really important to know um, how it works. Okie dokie. So these nerves coming out of the brachial plexus, where do they go? So let's follow each one uh, in turn again. Don't worry too much about this right now because in upper limb two and three, we're going to be talking about the actual arm more. Uh, at the moment, we're just sticking to mostly the shoulder. Um, so you will come up across these again and again. So the radial nerve, it goes across the back basically. So your entire back half of your arm, so if you're in the anatomical position, the posterior part of your arm, um, that is all supplied by your radial nerve. Okay. Um, on the other side, um, so that, again, that's remember that's the posterior one, your axillary nerve is just hanging out um, in your shoulder. So that only leaves the ones that are anterior um, at the brachial plexus. So your median nerve goes through the middle. Um, it actually doesn't supply much in your upper arm, but then it supplies a bunch of stuff down in your, um, your lower arm. And it's, actually, it's a little bit towards the sort of the lateral side of that. Confusingly named, the median nerve ends up being on the, the lateral side of the hand, um, but it'll make more sense as you go through it. The ulnar nerve also goes down um, and supplies the, um, the medial part, again confusing, of your forearm and your hand. Okay, um, So those two, they're both more concerned with the lower arm, basically. Um, the upper arm is handled by the one um, that was most lateral at the brachial plexus, the musculocutaneous nerve. So the muscular cutaneous nerve, your upper, the, like the front part of your upper limb, the anterior part, that's all supplied by the muscular cutaneous nerve. Um, your median handles most of your forearm, your ulna handles a little bit of your forearm, um, and they both supply your hand. That's the basics. Again, you'll go through this again and again, and it'll start to come more naturally to you. Uh, that's the same sort of stuff. Uh, Summarized, uh, in terms of um, sensation, so that's where you feel it. Um, there's more maths and, and things for this, um, but they basically all um, supply the, the sensory feedback um, to different areas. So axillary regimental badge, that just means like over your shoulder. So if you're wearing like a military uniform, where would your badge be? Yeah. Um, the rest is all fairly straightforward. So parts of your forearm um, and palm and your fingers and all sorts of things. All right, um, really quickly, we're gonna talk about dermatomes and cutaneous innervation. So the dermatomes, that's the diagram on the left. Um, so that's basically saying this spinal root, so the stuff coming out of your, your spinal cord, your spine, um, supplies the sensory innervation to this part of your skin, okay? Um, excuse me. So that's all very neat because it's all organized by spinal cord. Um, and when you're a little embryo in your, in your um, developmental stage, Everything is low, sort of very neatly developing in that sense. Um, like everything, it's like you're a whole a bit of salami and they get stretched out. And so it looks very neat when you actually map it out. You see it's all just a bunch of little um, lines across your body. 
when we get to nerves, it gets a little bit more complicated because like I said, they come out of spinal roots and then they mix and they go to different places based on what they uh, they supply. So, excuse me. Cutaneous innervation is we say not this root, but this nerve supplies this area. Um, so you can see the map on the, the right there. Looks scary, it's not necessarily too scary. Um, it's all talking about different parts um, of different nerve supplies basically. Um, so you can see there your axillary nerves, you can see parts of your um, ulnar nerves, you can see parts of your median nerve, all that sort of thing. So again, just remember that the difference between those dermatomes are by spinal root, cutaneous innervation is by nerve. There's also something called myotomes, which is like which parts of your muscles are supplied by which um, spinal root. They're a little bit less high yield, so I won't talk about them here, but good to know that they exist and you can look at them um, if you want as well. Okie dokie, movement. So this will start to make more sense hopefully now. So we have again, more anatomical terms. We have terms for directions, we have terms for planes. We also have terms for movement. So if I can, I don't know how well I can demonstrate here. So abduction, it's when you move. So ab, if you did Latin or whatever, um, or as Kyle actually pointed out in chat, I think, um, abduction is like you're taking something away, right? You kidnap a person or something. So abduction is taking your arms away from your body. So imagine if you do jumping jacks or something, that's abduction, all right? Um, adduction is the opposite. So ab away, add towards. Um, that's the, the different things that happen there. Um, flexion and extension, that's forwards and back. So if I swivel here, so if I flex my arm, I'm moving it forward like that. If I extend my arm, I'm moving it back. So strictly speaking, um, we can humans can do a thing called hyper extension so extension should technically just be the opposite of flexion um but you can extend your arm a little bit further back um and that's called hyper extension you don't need to worry about it too much um but that's just part of your, your normal range of movement so remember flex extend and so that actually extend that actually means the arm as well um, we won't talk about the arm itself because we're going to focus on the shoulder but like all of this stuff when we talk about flexing all of that is flexion because you're all you're you're sort of folding it all in the same direction, if that makes sense. Um, circumduction, you know, just making windmills with your arms. Um, so that's something that only certain joints can do. And so um, the ball and socket, so both the ball and socket and the um, the planar joints in the rest of your your pectoral girdle allow you to do that. Sorry, allow you to do that. Um, Internal and external rotation is a little bit harder to understand. It helps if I put my arm, uh, my arm up like this. So basically, internal rotation is when you do this. So focus on my shoulder joint, ignore the arm itself. I'm not moving that. Internal rotation is this. External rotation is that, okay? Um, you can also do it down like in the diagram there that shows you further down. Medial is internal, lateral is external. Um, I'll come back to that actually because it, it helps show you some interesting stuff. Um, but that's the basic idea. Um, so yeah, I've had a question in the <laughs> excellent work from Kyle here. Um, I've had a question in the chat. So, so far, um, cutaneous and dermatome. Okay, sorry. Um, so I'll clarify that. So your these are both talking about the skin. Okay. Um, so this is saying this area of skin is supplied by this spinal nerve and this. Uh, sorry, this spinal root and this nerve, okay? So the difference between them um, is just, are they organizing it by spinal root or are they organizing it by nerve? Both of them are saying this area of skin, um, the sensation, so when you touch your skin, that sensory perception is um, you're sent back to your brain through um, this spinal root and this nerve. Um, what it, be correct to say that the C6 part of the muscular cutaneous nerve supplies the dermatome region that that specific nerve innervate. Uh, yeah, more or less. So remember at the same time though, um, so the C6 part of the nerve um, uh, is going to be, uh, sorry, the C6 dermatome is going to be supplied not only by the muscular cutaneous nerve, um, but also by other nerves, other branches of the nerve. So keep in mind, I'm only, doing a very uh, like light overview. Um, and when you get down into it, there's lots of different superficial branches of the nerves which do the actual work. But yeah, so if 
you line up the C6 dermatome and the muscular uh, cutaneous nerve cutaneous innervation, um, then that area will be the C6 part of the muscular cutaneous nerve. Yeah, that works. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions. All right. So again, movements on the shoulder. We're going to use these as a base to understand what the different muscles do. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that soon. Okie dokie. So intrinsic muscles of the shoulder. These ones are basically ones that come from the, I shouldn't say clavicle and or clavicle. Uh, I'm going to write these down. Um, uh, clavicle or scapula. So your, your collarbone or your shoulder um, blade. Um, fix that after the presentation. All right, so um, they come from the clavicle or the scapula and they insert on the humerus. Okay, so remember origin is the one that doesn't move. So your pectoral girdle don't, doesn't move during these movements, um, but your humerus, your actual arm bone does move. Okay, um, there are six of these uh, muscles in total. Of these, um, four of them form something called the rotator cuff. Okay, um, so the uh, rotator cuff is a bunch of muscles which all sit on the head of the humerus uh, and which all come from the scapula, okay? Um, and they're all important to stabilizing your shoulder, okay? So the um, supraspinatus sits um, up on top of the spine of the scapula. So supra above spinatus spine, okay? That's not talking about the actual spine, it's talking about the spine of the scapula. So if you remember, that's on the posterior side. So this is a muscle that comes from the posterior side of the scapula and sits partially on the anterior side of your humerus here. So just to, um, to orient you, um, this, like the hand diagram here, that's looking as if you're looking at a, a, um, a left shoulder from the, uh, hmm. uh, I'm trying to visualize this for a sec. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, that's looking at the, the left shoulder through that. Um, I, I really feel like that should be the right. Anyway, we'll figure it out. Um, the um, supraspinatus sits on the top. Sub, uh, sorry, infraspinatus. Um, that sits just underneath the spine of the scapula on the back. Okay. Um, and the teres minor sits on the, um, sits just underneath both of those. So that's further down on the scapula and it inserts further down on the humerus itself. Um, so that forms the sit part of this axon. So you say sit, so SIT you, as you go down. Um, and then on the front, the subscapularis is the only one that comes from the front. Um, and that comes from the inside of the scapula. So if you imagine the shoulder blade again, you have the posterior part, which is sort of the top of the scapula. And then you have the anterior part, which is underneath the scapula between the scapula and the rib cage. That's where the subscapularis comes from. And it inserts on the front of the humerus basically. So uh, the deltoid is a, another muscle which comes through this whole area um, and it starts from the clavicle basically. It, it goes around to both the clavicle and the scapula. Um, it makes a sort of V shape at the top and so it actually lets you do a lot of different things. So the front part of the deltoid can help you move your arm like this. The back part of the deltoid can help you move your arm in other directions. And the middle part of the deltoid or the main movement of the deltoid is to help abduct your arm. Um, so there's lots of different things that you can do with the larger muscles, which have a lot of different fibers, muscle fibers, pointing in different directions. Um, but we'll, we'll elaborate on that a little bit. So the other one that I talked about is the, that I didn't talk about is the teres major. So that's the one, if you see here, um, it's sort of uh, in the, the subscapularis diagram, the green one. It's the one below the subscapularis. So it comes from further down your body a little bit um, and it inserts on the humerus. It's not actually from um, the scapula. So it breaks the rules a little bit for this group, um, but it also, it's also part of the same group. So intrinsic muscles of the shoulder. This say summary sort of thing. Um, eventually you'll understand this. A point I want to stress here is do not try to just like straight up memorize, um, if anything, the muscle action, okay? So innovation, sometimes it can be a bit um, memorizing. Uh, to an extent, you can think logically. So, okay, well, this nerve supplies this area and especially um, when it comes to the parts of the arm. So when we talk about muscles that are on the front or back of the arm or, or, or forearm, 
uh, those ones you can think logically uh, because there are certain nerves that supply those areas. The rotator cuff muscles, it's a little bit more up in the air because you've got a lot of different nerves which run through there, so you may have to memorize them. Um, and you will have to memorize the attachments, but that's just where it is. But once you know the attachments, you should be able to figure out what the muscle does, okay? Um, because they all do the same, because, because literally, so every muscle does the same thing, it pulls. It pulls the insertion closer to the origin. Okay, so if, let's use an example. Supraspinatus, origin, um, or the proximal attachment, same thing. Um, that's the top part of the scapula. Distal attachment, part of the humerus, okay? So that's the back of the scapula to the back of the humerus, okay? So when it pulls, if you, the only way to get the, the, uh, the back of the scapula to, uh, if anything, it's more the side of the humerus, um, the only way to move that closer is to turn your arm. So what does the, what does the supraspinatus do? It turns your arm. It laterally rotates your arm. Okay, everything works like that. Literally, you can go through the origin and insertion of every muscle and just imagine what would happen if I pulled from here to here and their direction, like straight up. Um, so that's the way you should be thinking about muscles. Don't just think of them as like, you know, oh, here's this thing which, like, like I can memorize everything that works. Um, it'll make it so much easier for you to understand these things if you don't have to memorize it because you can think about it in terms of this pulls from here to here, okay? Um, so yeah, you can see, like I said there, the deltoid, um, it has a lot of different movements um, because it has a lot of different parts. Um, <clears throat> losing my voice immediately. Um, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, um, and the teres minor. So the, the supraspinatus, um, it can, uh, sorry, I, I mis-explained that a little bit before. Supraspinatus, because it's a little bit higher up, um, it can, abduct the arm so it, lateral rotation is actually not its main job um, but because it's higher up so it's sort of close to the top of the scapula um, it then pulls near the top and to the side medial sorry lateral um, of the humerus when it pulls those together pull you know you imagine this getting shorter means your arm goes up so it helps the delta do that the one that i was thinking about when i was explaining the, su the supraspinatus is actually the infraspinatus um, so that's it just just underneath that's properly like the back the middle um, or the outside, that one laterally rotates the arm, my bad. Um, so if you remember the rotator cuff, so there's supraspinatus on the top, infraspinatus, infraspinatus and teres minor on the back. So supraspinatus, it's gonna pull like that. Infraspinatus and teres minor, they're gonna pull like that to the back. The one part of the rotator cuff that actually is on the other side, so inserts on the um, uh, anterior side of the humerus is the subscapularis. So what's it going to do? It's going to do the opposite because everything comes back to the attachments, right? So since it's pulling this, like the front of your humerus closer to like the underside of your shoulder bone, it's going to rotate your arm the other way. Okay. Um, and that's how it works. So again, literally everything comes back to the attachments. So if you consider where they are and you imagine them pulling, you will understand the muscle. Okie dokie. Um, clinical significance. So one thing that we get in a lot of athletes, especially swimmers, is rotator cuff tendinopathy. So this is basically, um, you get irritation of the tendon. So the tendons are not part of the muscles, but they're the, every muscle uses a um, tendon to attach to the bone. Um, so the um, tendons can then get in, inflamed um, because they get irritated, basically. Um, so if you, you swim a lot, you probably use your rotator cuff muscles a lot, you know, you like doing stroke, whatever. Um, and that presents as um, a sort of difficulty of movement in that area, pain on movement, that sort of thing. Um, so if you don't treat it, and especially if you keep using the muscle because the tendon's out of whack, if you keep moving, using the muscle, um, you can get permanent tendon damage and you can also get bursitis, which is remember those um, little fluid fill sacs, those can actually get inflamed as well, um, which is obviously quite bad. Um, supraspinatus, um, tendonitis is actually the most common one. Um, and that's the one uh, actually shown there. So in um, a supraspinatus tear, the reason it's particularly uh, vulnerable is because it runs through an enclosed space. So it comes basically between the acromion there, that little process, and the humerus on the top of the scapula. So that's a very small enclosed space, um, which makes it easier for it to you know, rub and get inflamed and then eventually tear. 
Um, so this is a bad thing. It's bad to go continue use of the arm if you want to avoid it. Okay, the extrinsic muscles of the shoulder. These are much less low yield um, than the, uh, sorry, they're much lower yield um, than the intrinsic muscles of the shoulder, um, but they're still important. So the trapezius uh, and the latissimus dorsi are what we call superficial. So they lie on top of the, um, the other deep muscles. Um, so if you were to slowly dissect um, a cadaver, you know, you go from the outside to the inside, you would encounter the trapezius and the lat dorsi first. Um, so the trapezius is the big boy, right? This is the largest muscle on your back um, and it covers a huge amount of space. And again, because of that huge space, it can do a lot of different things. Um, so it can pull the scapula up like that a little bit um, and rotate it a little bit. Um, it can also actually pull it down and to the side in some cases um, because there are all those different muscle fibers pointing in different directions. Um, your lat dorsi, so that's to do with, with sort of um, adducting your arm um, and internally rotating it. Um, your rhomboid, so uh, levator um, scapula, literally the name translates to lifter of the uh, scapula or shoulder blade. Um, and so surprise, surprise, it does exactly that. Um, your rhomboid minor and major, they actually can be quite difficult to differentiate in a cadaver because um, they're both running in the same direction and that little break between them isn't always present. Um, and so they have very similar purposes. So in terms of um, what they do, I've shamelessly stolen this from Pierce Tufts because they have a very good, um, they had a very good table on what each of these things do and their innovation. Um, so the rhomboid, they both help stabilize the scapula. Um, the levator elevates the scapula medially. So again, consider lifts the scapula up medially towards the middle, which means we'll get inferior rotation. Um, the lat dorsi again, you can bring your arms towards you um, and do that. So one thing I want you to, un to just imagine for a sec is when you um, sort of pull your arm down um, and, and sorry, let's think of another way. So if you hold your arms um, like 90 degrees like this, and then you try to internally rotate them, you can sort of feel um, how you hunch over a little bit at the, at the front. Um, that's because a group of muscles that we talk about, we're gonna talk about in a sec, um, your pectorals help make that movement, okay? And they're from the front, which means you hunch over a little bit like that. When you externally rotate, so you sort of start with your arm like that, and you go that, you can feel yourself, like your the bottom of your arm moves a little bit in and towards the bottom. That's because your lat dorsi is in and towards the bottom, and it's the one actually pulling it up. Um, so again, all of these things translate to actually, you know, different movements in your body when you use them. Um, because they're not perfect, right? They, they're a little bit irregular, they're a little bit um, different. And so these movements are not entirely perfect when we do them. Um, you, can, you can always think about how it comes back to the different attachments of the muscle. Okay, um, active appendicular muscle. Again, so, you know, talking about your pectoral muscles and a few other ones associated with them. Um, so the reason I put work, scare quotes, excuse me, about um, or around superficial and deep is that technically um, the pec major is only really over the pec minor. Um, the serratus anterior is low enough that part of it isn't covered by the pec major and the subclavius is just sort of doing its own thing. Um, they all do di different things. Um, the pec major and sorry, the pec major and minor are mostly to do with moving your arms forward. So if you, you, know, you pull your arms forward, um, that's going to use your pec. Um, your serratus anterior and your subclavius, um, they have more, uh, harder to understand uses. So the subclavius, that one is mostly to do um, with, again, surprise, surprise, the clavicle. So it runs directly under the clavicle um, and it's going to be pulling it down in some cases. The serratus anterior, so that one's a little bit trickier. So it actually starts on the ribs. You can see here in this diagram, um, it starts on the ribs and then it attaches to the scapula actually. Um, and so that can, both help stabilize the scapula because again, we have very little um, osteo attachment, very little bony attachment. And so we need a lot of muscles to anchor it. Um, the, uh, and so the, the, like it both stabilizes that and it actually can help rotate the scapula because it can pull it in different directions. Okie dokie, <laughs> yeah. These are summary tables. Don't memorize them fully. Um, so the, the origins and insertions the reason I say that is because you don't really need to know the origin and insertion of certain muscles. 
Um, the shoulder girdle particularly, um, muscles of the shoulder joint, it can actually be a good thing to memorize the origins and insertions, but this one don't just fully um, memorize it um, because some of it's just not super high yield. Um, if you have time, feel free to do it because again, anatomy is infinitely deep, um, but don't just go into it like I'm gonna understand anatomy because I'm gonna uh, just memorize these things. Um, first understand where they are, and then that'll give you a guide and you can almost sort of guess their origins and insertions um, by their movements and vice versa. Like I said, so it's all interrelated there. Um, so yeah, this one, the important thing um, that I want to, to stress here is the relationship between the movements and the muscles. So previously we talked about it as a muscle group. Now we're talking about how that translates to the movements I talked about at the start. Um, so elevation and depression, it should be noted. This first one is talking about the shoulder girdle itself. This is, this is not talking about your arm, the actual shoulder joint. It's talking about um, pectoral girdle. Um, so this is like, when I say elevation, that's not moving your arm, that's abduction. That's not the same thing. Um, what this is, is a shrug, basically. Elevation, depression. That's what we're talking about here. Um, so make sure you don't mix those up. That's all that stuff. Okay, let's talk about arteries. So we're getting, don't worry, we're getting close to the end. Um, the arterial supply of the upper limb um, is all based on the one major artery, okay? Um, and that's, it stays the same artery. Like it's just, if you looked at it in the body itself, it's just one big um, line, but it has three different names at three different points. So it starts as the subclavian artery, um, so that's where it, from where it starts in the actual, it starts from your aorta, your main artery, um, comes out of the subclavian, um, it goes out, um, it has the same name until it gets to something called your first rib, um, which is part of, well, hey, part of your rib cage. Um, when we have the axillary artery, sorry, we then call it the axillary artery, um, which is named for a certain place called the axilla, so we'll talk about it in a sec. Um, that's from the first rib, to the lower border of the teres major muscle. So you remember the teres minor, which comes from the scapula and the teres major, which comes from lower on the body. Um, and then the brachial, we call it the brachial artery um, from that point to the upper border of the cubital fossa. Cubital fossa is a fancy way of saying this little bit in your um, elbow joint. Um, so we call it a brachial artery from all of that. The reason we stop calling it the brachial artery after that is it actually splits. So it's just one artery from all the way from where it starts to um, this point, and then from there it splits. That's not to say that it doesn't give off branches. So there are lots of different branches of the artery which come off, but the main bulk doesn't split until we get to the arm. Um, the two arteries that it splits to in the arm are the radial, so that's more lateral, um, closer to your thumb, um, and the ulna, which is more medial. These are actually a little bit redundant um, because they both go to the same place and because they join up at the end. Um, so a little bit of a trivia which they might mention is that when you need an artery in a different place, sometimes they'll take one of these arteries because you can usually um, survive okay without one of them. Um, don't, again, I'm not gonna talk too much about the arterial venous um, supply because it will come up more um, when we talk about um, the rest of the arm. So we talk about elbow joint, wrist, hand, that sort of stuff. Um, but we do have a little few bits that we're gonna focus on which are closer to the shoulder. So. Um, right up near the shoulder, we have the posterior and anterior um, humeral circumflex arteries, okay? Um, so they come from the axillary artery, so before it gets called the brachial artery, um, and they come around the humeral head, so right at the shoulder. So if we have a fall onto the outstretched hand, push, that sort of little keyword, um, we have a risk of a humeral head fracture or a proximal um, humeral fracture, um, which can rupture that artery. Um, and potentially cause necrosis of the artery itself and the, um, the tissue around it because they're just not getting enough oxygen. Um, so that's a particularly vulnerable area. Another particularly vulnerable area uh, is the deep brachial artery. So you can see it kind of there in the diagram where the artery comes down next to the, the humerus. Uh, you can see there's one big branch which goes around it. That's the deep brachial artery. Um, and so that one goes through that radial groove, that little corkscrew thing which wraps around. And what that means is that if we have a mid shaft humerus fracture, that and the radial nerve, which runs alongside it, are both vulnerable um, to damage in that case. Okay, venous drainage. So arteries away from the heart, venous towards 
um, heart. So we actually have a whole venous system, deep, the deep veins, um, which is literally just paired with the artery. Um, so they have the same names because they are going alongside the arteries. Um, they actually use the pulses of the arteries because your arteries have those muscles in them that help contract them. Um, they actually help push um, your deoxygenated blood, in this case, back the other way. Um, so they have the same names, axillary, brachial, ulna, and radial. Um, so the, um, the stuff in your fingers, uh, we'll just go down like talking there, um, your ulnar and radial vein, in the same way that your ulnar and radial arteries turn into a little arch in your hand, um, both deeply, like there's a superficial arch and a, and a deep arch, and then little um, arteries in your fingers. There are also arteries in your vein, the superficial and a deep arch, and then ulnar and radial veins, which go alongside it. Um, so they both um, follow the same route. They literally lie alongside the artery. Um, and the dorsal venal, uh, venous plexus, which we call, which is just a bunch of um, veins in your hand, um, they're part of the next area. So that's the superficial vein. Um, and so that's the main drainage um, for your hand, um, which is why we get both the cephalic and basilic vein um, running from the back of your hand forward. So if you look at the back of your hand, you'll see more veins, or you'll be able to feel more veins um, because that's a larger part of your hand um, drainage. So the cephalic vein is more lateral um, and more superior. So you can think of it again, if you have your arm out like that, superior and lateral become the same thing. Um, and the basilic vein is more inferior and more medial. Um, both of them come from the dorsal hand. They have slightly different roots. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the axilla. Um, the basilic vein, it sort of goes into the arm deeply around the upper arm and it forms along with the brachial vein, the axillary vein. Um, so it's not exactly a coincidence that um, the place where we change the name, um, so axillary to, to sorry, brachial to axillary, um, is that joint. Um, so roughly that place, um, the brachial vein and the basilic vein join together into one deep um, vein called the axillary vein, which runs along the axillary artery. Um, the cephalic vein takes a longer route. So instead of going deep into the arm and joining up there, it takes its own little route for a little bit longer um, before eventually joining while it's already the axillary vein. Um, so superficial versus deep venous drainage. The superficial veins are the ones that you'll be actually seeing. Um, so if you look at your body, the little bits of vein that you can see, they're all superficial. Um, the deep ones you usually can't because again, they run deep with your artery. There's a particular one called the cubital vein. So you can see it right there, it's right over the elbow joint. It joins the um, cephalic and basilic vein. Um, the relevance of this is not actually mostly anatomical, it's actually mostly practical. Um, because if you've ever had blood taken or something like that, they'll use that vein um, because it's an easy one to find, less easy one to sort of stab. Um, and it's just useful when we want to take blood. So when we want access to your veins, um, we'll usually use the cubital vein. There's also a group of veins called perforating veins, and they basically connect between the superficial system, um, which is the, the higher up stuff, closer to the skin, and the deep venous system. So they're both important there. Um, I've got a question here. This is in further on. Sorry, I didn't get this, to this before. What's the difference between extrinsic musculature and axioappendicular muscles? Um, so the extrinsic musculature um, is mostly on the back. So your trapezius right on the back, your lateral C further down, um, your levator, levator, I don't know how to pronounce that, um, levator scapulae and your rhomboids, they're all on the back. Your axial appendicular uh, are predominantly on the front and wrapping around. That's the main reason. Um, some ones like the subclavian um, and the, uh, sorry, no, never mind that, but it's not true. Um, so they all join to parts of the shoulder, the pectoral girdle or the humerus itself, um, but they usually come from the front um, and the extrinsic ones come from the back. That's the main real difference. Sorry, um, is there much indifference on my mic? Hopefully it's not too much sound. Um, sounds like there might be some interference. Hopefully you guys can still hear me okay. Maybe, probably, I will assume so. Yeah, all we right. can. Easy. All right. Okay. Um, I think this is the last part, so all good. This is the next bit called uh, the axilla. 
So this is an area. Um, this is not a particular structure. It's a space within the body. Um, and we find it under the shoulder joint. Um, this is not a static space because you can move your arm and the shape of the axilla and the size of the axilla will actually change. But the stuff inside it will stay the same because it's not usually particularly stretchy. Um, so the importance of the axilla to us is mostly because of what's in it and the way things enter and leave it. Okay. Um, the most important thing in the axilla that's the brachial plexal thread there. Um, we also have something called the axillary lymph nodes, which are a bunch of lymph nodes in the axilla. Surprise, surprise. Um, I'll talk about those at the end because they're important to um, cancer spread. We also have the axillary artery and its branches and the axillary vein and its tributary. So you can note the difference there. Branches because we're spreading out, tributaries because we're you know, coming back in. Um, the short head of the bicep brachii muscle, so check your bicep. Um, and your coracobrachialis muscle are both um, running, they both run through here, okay? Um, so you can think there are sort of four main groups. So there's the plexus, which is nerves, lymph nodes, lymph, um, vasculature, so your arteries and your veins, and then muscle. Um, the borders of the axilla, they're defined by the different muscles um, that you can see there on the bottom right, um, because it's pretty straightforward. It's just a case of memorizing, really. Okie dokie, the openings of the axilla, this is an important part. So the cervicoaxillary canal, also called the apex of the axilla, it's a little bit easier to say. Um, this is where most of the stuff, almost everything comes into the axilla. Um, so that's the top, right at the, the, the top part of the axilla. Um, so the nerves, arteries, veins, even the lymphatic um, actually come through this particular area. So the first rib, so that's again, the top of your page, you can see it there. Um, the clavicle, excuse me, clavicle at the front and the superior edge of the scapula, um, they form sort of a triangle sort of shape, um, and that's the, the actual canal. So if you injure the clavicle, you might damage this area, which is quite bad. Um, usually the movement of the clavicle um, sort of helps it a little bit in avoiding this, but um, that lateral half, lateral one third, sorry, um, can sometimes uh, endanger this area. So there's something we, want, we need to worry about. One thing that I haven't put on the slide, which, but which I do want to mention, is something called the thoracic outlet, which is basically the top of your rib cage where a bunch of important stuff comes out. Okay, so your rib cage, it's this nice little cage protecting everything inside. Problem with that is that you do need to eventually take things out. And so that means we have to have a little um, outlet, a little opening at the top, um, where all of your arteries, veins, um, and your lymphatics, which supply your arm, um, have to come out and they sort of arc over. You can see in the, the second diagram there, they're all coming out of the thoracic outlet and arcing over into the cervical axillary canal. Um, that's a potentially dangerous area because if you get stabbed in that area, not only is there um, danger to all of those important vessels, there's also danger to the top of your lung um, because that's one of the places from which your lungs aren't actually properly covered. Um, so that's an, a critically important place. Um, the base of the axilla, that's where most of the stuff Exit. So most of the axilla is just a whole bunch of stuff coming under your clavicle um, and going into your arm. Pretty straightforward. But there are some exceptions, so we need to talk about the exceptions. So the first one is the clavipectoral triangle. Um, so the boundary of this one is your pec major, which is attaching to your humerus, you've got your deltoid, which is arcing over, and you've got your clavicle, which is coming up a little bit to the side. They have a little um, opening in the middle. So there's a little space left by those. They don't fully cover up the shoulder joint. Um, and we have the cephalic vein, which we talked about before, um, that comes through that. Entry of the upper limb is a bit fuzzy because it actually comes from the upper limb and goes into the axilla. Um, but you get the, you get the idea. Veins flow in the, the other direction. Um, so the cephalic vein, as we know, it's part of the superficial system. So it's going to lie on top of most of the rest of the stuff inside you. Um, and so it needs that opening to actually get inside. Um, we also have a bunch of different spaces or list listed on the diagram to the bottom um, right there. So quadrangular and triangular spaces and the triangular interval. Um, all of those are sending stuff to the back, basically. Um, so instead of going straight through the axilla, these things need to hop out at the back. Um, in the case of the circumflex scapular artery, um, it's because they need to go to the scapula. In the case of the radial nerve and the profonda brachii, it's because they need to go to the back of the arm. Um, and in the case of the, the axillary nerve um, and some of the circumflex stuff, 
is because they need to go to the back of, of the shoulder. Um, so they're all important. Um, they're a little bit hard to understand, it's, but once you get it, it's pretty fine. You just see like the, the ways in which those muscles don't fully cover the area. Um, the boundaries of all of those are defined by the muscles around them. Um, so say the triangular interval, humerus, um, lat dorsi slash um, teres major, um, and triceps brachii. Um, and you can do the same thing for all of them. Okie dokie, final bit of this uh, upper limb one anatomy for today. Um, congrats to you all for sticking along. This has been a bit of a marathon. Hopefully we'll cut it down a little bit in, in future years, but I can't guarantee, uh, sorry, future weeks, but I can't guarantee because we have lots of stuff to get through. Um, so we talk about the auxiliary lymph nodes. So this is, uh, the auxiliary in general is not super high yield. Um, this is a little bit more high yield just because they harp on a lot about this uh, in the case of breast cancer. Um, so basically there are five groups of lymph nodes in the axilla. Um, so you have your pectoral um, nodes, which are towards the front and the inside, um, your humeral nodes, which are towards the side. Um, there are also something called lateral nodes. Um, you have your subscapular nodes or posterior nodes at the back and the middle. Um, and then you have two groups, the central and apical nodes, which basically just drain the other ones and form this big chain heading back into your thorax. Um, so there are different names for some of these. So the, the um, lateral and posterior ones slash humeral and subscapular ones. Between these two diagrams, we have all the names of them. Um, so the, um, the significance of this is because those central and apical nodes eventually drain like right into your thorax and right into your, um, your SVC, superior vena cava. Um, and when they do that, it means that if you have um, a metastasis, so you have um, cancer in your in the breast, because of your breast cancer, um, and those cells start to spread, they can spread through the lymph nodes and actually get straight to the central circulation. That is bad because that means your, your, those cancer cells can spread throughout your body. Um, and so we don't want that. So it's quite important um, that we understand how these work if you want to talk about um, breast cancer spread to understand it. Had a question uh, in the chat. Can you explain what fascia is? The lecture mentions a few times in relation to the axilla. So fascia is sort of connective tissue. Um, so there's sort of, there's a whole bunch, there's not, your body isn't just a big bag uh, with a whole bunch of muscles and stuff bouncing around inside it. It has sheets of this material throughout your body, um, usually associated with muscles. So you'll often find it wrapping around um, the muscle or moving underneath the muscle. Um, and that helps bound um, parts of the axilla as well. So if you go up, Um, so the thoracic wall has fascia as well, um, and several of the other parts will also have um, parts of, of, of that um, throughout the axilla and forming the border. Um, yeah, it's, I'd say it's more relevant when you talk about, um, the, the, it's useful for the axilla, it's probably more relevant when you're talking about the muscles of the arm, so you'll, you'll see more of that later. Um, yeah, so imagine, it's sort of like wrapping like glad wrap or something, but it's very strong. Um, so it, it sort of adds structure and shape. Yeah, like packaging, exactly. Um, structure and shape, those muscles. This one is just a, a summary of all the uh, different nodes. So the different names, um, them uh, and what they, they drain. So the pectoral nodes are the ones of um, concern in breast cancer. Uh, those drain into the central apical nodes, and then those go out of the axilla and into the danger zone. Um, so we want to be careful with those. Okie dokie. That wraps up our volume one. Um, feel free to ask any questions. Other than that, I will be handing off to, uh, I actually can't remember if this was Jane Am or Jane Or, uh, but whoever did the introduction to motor systems. That would be me. Yes, Jane Am. Perfect. All right. Thanks, James. Um, I just want to give you guys a bit of uh, like tips in terms of anatomy as well. Like, I don't remember 50% of what James is saying, like in this year. So don't worry if not everything is like really, really new. There's a lot of different topics like, you know, the ligaments and all the different mini like perforating arteries and things like that, which you don't need to actually remember. It's just getting a big sort of general picture idea and also being able to get all your different clinical relevance points and being able to link those to the relevant anatomy. As long as you can understand the clinical relevance in the context of anatomy, you should be okay. Um, but we will be going over more complicated. So going down the arm as well in the 
the rest of the weeks. But I'm hoping that for now, we'll be able to have a bit of a change in pace and go to a bit of physiology. If you guys have seen the slides, it's a very short section. So let me just share my screen. It shouldn't take too long. Oh, I think um, screen sharing is disabled, James. I can't seem to be able to screen share. Yeah, one moment, hold on. Yeah, no oh, I'll jump. I'll jump in for a second there as well and just say, yeah, um, as Jaden was saying, this is like, I can remember how intense anatomy was um, to start with, especially. It's like a brick wall. Um, and then it's you slowly get used to having your face pounded in by you running into a brick wall at first. Um, and slowly you start to make headway into the brick wall. Um, so it's something that just takes a bunch of repetition. Um, when you're walking around, just sort of think like, oh, can I feel things? And and that's what you'll um you'll you'll build. Um, as you're going through. Um, also, obviously, yeah, this is a bit of a long sesh because we're introducing you to anatomy and James is doing his beautiful upper limb stuff. But um, yeah, just trust yourself, um, be kind to yourself. This is very intense. It's a lot of information. And as Jane was saying, like, you probably won't remember or need to remember a lot of what is going on. It's just um, getting more familiar with the, the stuff that's really high yield really important and sort of actually um, can start to make a bit more logical sense to you as you repeat it over and over. All right, thanks. That is unless you want to become an anatomy professor at Monash University, then you might need to know everything. Um, but if you just want to become a doctor, uh, at this stage, this is all you need to know. So just changing pace and going into a bit of physiology, I'm going to be taking you through introduction to motor systems. The lecture itself is also quite short. I think it is roughly half an hour to an hour long if it's the same from last year, but most of it is just the lecture kind of going into sort of the personal stories and things. So it's not actually that long if you think about it. Um, I think you guys might have Michael Luang, I think who was the professor, but I'm not sure if that's the same this year. Anyways, the, the topic is very short. So I'm gonna try and keep it as quick as possible. Uh, in terms of the definition of motor control, it is basically the information processing part of it. So how does your central nervous system, so your brain and your spine, how is it able to get the signals through to your musculoskeletal system, which James was pretty much talking about right now? How is it able to control all the different contractions and relaxations of muscles to give you coordinated movements and skilled movements? So we're going to be talking about, there's all sorts of different things happening, the sensory inputs that you can get from your environment. For example, um, you have a cup in front of you and you want to pick that up. That's the set, your, your eyes are sort of taking in that information. And then you have some sort of processing and planning that happens in your brain to try and coordinate that movement to go ahead and then grab that cup and then bring it closer to your mouth and drink. So that's the motor output. That is sort of the general idea that we're going for. I think in the lecture also, um, you do go into a bit about the cortical areas. So I, I believe that this will be coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I'm not gonna go into it in a, in a huge bit of detail, but there are different areas of the brain that are responsible for motor control as well as sensory input. Of course, we're gonna be focusing on things like the primary motor cortex, um, the supplementary motor cortex and so on with the next slides. Uh, here's also just a very big picture overview of all the different parts of the brain that are involved. So this is the right image if you can't see my cursor. So there's all sorts of different parts of the brain that are involved. Even at this stage um, of like year two, we haven't learned about all the different parts of the brain. So don't be worried if this is really, really foreign to you, but it just shows you how complicated the process is and how many different parts of the brain are actually involved. So it's not a simple process is the main idea of that slide. Now, this is probably, I'm not sure if this was covered last semester again, because I'm kind of new um, to this group, but I feel that you should have covered a bit about the divisions of the, the spinal cord, as well as just the nervous system. Um, you might be aware of the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and then you have things underneath peripheral nervous system. They're all sort of interlinked. They're not actually as separate as they look, but today we're gonna be focusing on the motor division all the bits that have asterisks on them will be stuff that we cover later on. So our focus is just on motor. And just a bit of terminology as well, which you, you might be familiar with. Whenever I say efferent, I just mean the nerves that are having some sort of motor function or motor capacity. And afferent is things going back up to the CNS and that's gonna be your sensory information. All right, also if there's any questions, uh, James or Kyle or anyone else, please let me know because I can't see the chat for some reason. Um, okay, let's go into the motor neurons. So we know, you, you might remember from sort of anatomy um, back in semester one, you look at the cross-section 
of your spinal cord. And there's all sorts of different parts. You have the gray matter and the white matter and, and so on. The motor neurons are within the ventral horn. That's going to be this sort of, like if you were to take a cross section, it's usually the largest section at the front. And that's called the ventral horn, which is gray matter. Now, this is not going to be a static picture. If you look at the bottom diagram as well, you'll see that in certain areas, for example, if we're talking about the upper limb, in the cross section you take that is near the upper limb, you might see that the ventral horn is much larger. Same goes for the lower limbs because you require a lot of motor control in those regions. So therefore you need to house more motor neurons, which means larger ventral horns. And another really small piece of trivia that is not so important is that the, the bodies of those neurons that are innervating distal muscles, so things near your fingers perhaps, or in your hand, might be located in distal parts of the ventral horn. So you can see this depiction at the, the top right. You can see that the hands are sort of on the distal parts and then things near the shoulder or near the, the medial aspect of your body might be more proximal. So it's closer to the proximal edges of that ventral horn. Another really small side note, which I think the lecturer goes into, is that there are many, many different names for motor neurons that innervate skeletal muscle fibers. So there's terms like lower motor neurons, motor neurons, alpha motor neurons, and the final common pathway. I think alpha motor neurons is probably the, or even lower motor neurons, they're probably the more important ones that you'll see. Um, and the reason why I say alpha motor neurons is because you will see all sorts of different things like gamma motor neurons and stuff. So if you know that this is alpha motor neurons is just the, the simple motor neurons that control your muscles, then that's gonna be really good for when you discuss all the another like different subtypes of neurons as well. Now, there are also two really important terminologies that you should also get used to is the motor unit and the motor pull. This diagram pretty much sums it up. I don't think I need to really put it into too many words, but a motor unit will be when there's one, so a unit just means one, so one motor neuron and all of the fibers that it innervates. So it's not necessary that one neuron has to just innervate one specific muscle or even one specific muscle fiber. It could be innervating a bunch of different things. So that's what we consider a motor unit. This also uh, brings up sort of subcategories of motor units. So you can have small ones that just innovate a little bit less than 10 or maybe 20 muscle fibers. And this is mostly for sort of, if you think about fingers and things, it's like dexterity. So you have better control of those muscles. But if you have large motor units, something in the order of thousands of muscle fibers per alpha motor neuron that innovates it, we're looking for power. So these are like the calf muscles when you're running or walking or jumping you will require large motor units to be able to facilitate those really gross movements of muscles. So that, that's the main difference between small and large. A motor pull is just the opposite. So instead of taking one motor neuron and all the fibers, we're thinking about all the, fi all the, the neurons that innervate a single muscle fiber. Um, and there's not much detail to go into for this, but we'll, we'll look into the next couple of slides on ways that we can sort of control the amount of power that we're generating from muscles. And these two concepts will come will become really, really crucial when we're, we're talking about those types of movements. So that's motor unit and motor pull. Okay, speaking of force generation, there are many, many different ways that we can increase the amount of force that is exerted by a specific muscle fiber. The first one that I'm gonna talk about is called rate coding. There's really only two ways to increase force generation and then we can sort of combine them in different ways to increase force. So rate coding is talking about us increasing the frequency by which we stimulate the muscle. So the nerve, we can just stimulate it once and it'll cause a little bit of contraction. But if we keep on stimulating it, it's gonna cause a continuous contraction. And if we exceed a certain point, we might actually get a continuous contraction, which we call the fused tetanus. But I'll get into that in just a second. There's a concept of temporal or force summation. And you can see that in the diagram here. Again, I'm not gonna to speak too much on it because the diagram pretty much sums it up. But if you have single sort of um, excitations, you will get small bumps in the, the, the muscle twitching. So this is at five Hertz. Again, Hertz is just frequency. So you have some small twitches of the muscle and it's not too uh, gross in terms of movement. However, if I keep on increasing the frequency, so you get you know 10 Hertz, you might see that the regions where they overlap, actually you get a bit of summation with the amount of force that's generated. So you kind of get this mountain uh, forming. However, if you keep on increasing, 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 you will get to a point where you reach a fused tetanus. And this is where it's so, so, so close to each other that the force is just the maximum that it can be. That's what we call a smooth summed force generation. So in other words, as I've kind of labeled here, 
if you increase the frequency of stimulation and also make sure that you stimulate the muscle before it has any time to relax, which is what was happening here, right? We stimulated once, then it relaxes. We stimulate it again, then it relaxes. If you don't give it that much time, it's just going to keep on generating more and more force until you reach that fused tetanus. Um, unfused tetanus is just like right before that. So it's where you get mini, mini, mini peaks. Um, and then if you increase it a bit more, then you get smooth um, some force. Okay, so that's the difference between unfused and fused tetanus. Another way that you can do this, and this is probably a bit easier to understand, is the size principle. So whenever I'm, let's say I've, I've got sort of two major actions that I want to do, and I think this is probably the example that was given to you in your lecture, is if, I, if I'm trying to pick up an egg and I need to make sure that I'm being really delicate with it, I don't want to exert too much force, right? I want more control and I want a little bit of force just to be able to pick it up. Eggs are not that heavy. So in that case, I'm only going to recruit a really small number of motor units. And I, as I said, these are recruited first because they generate less force. And also this will come on a little bit later. They're actually fatigue resistant. So these are the things that I'm using in everyday life. Even when I'm sitting down, I'm recruiting small amounts of uh, or small motor units to be able to do the really simple things that I'm doing every day. However, if I then want to take that egg and crush it, or I want to throw it at someone for whatever reason, then I'm going to need to use even more force. And in that case, I don't really shut down the small motor units and then use larger motor units. I kind of, it's sort of like a succession. I then evolve into starting to use larger motor units and it's called progressive recruitment. Okay. Um, and this is, of course, because if I try and use my small motor units to throw something, they're going to become very overwhelmed by the amount of force that I need to require. So they need to call on large motor units. And this is only when required, they generate even more force. However, they fatigue more easily, which sort of explains why we can't just keep using them in everyday life. We don't need them, first of all. And second of all, if we keep using them, they're not going to be able to, to function very effectively in the long term. Okay. Uh, and just as a, at a biochemical level, the reason why small motor units it's not like we choose with that we want to choose, like use small motor units versus large motor units. It's more so because small motor units are designed within the neurons to have a really low threshold potential. So when my brain says I need to do something and generates a specific amount of uh, threat, like potential, action potential, that's going to be enough to activate the small motor units, but probably not enough to activate the large motor units up until the point where the brain starts to panic and it thinks I need even more force it generates even more action potentials and then both of them will be activated. Okay, so it's not a conscious choice. It's more so the way that those neurons are actually, um, the neurons are actually structured biochemically. Okay, so we have this really nice order of recruitment. On the last sort of slides of your lecture, you will also come across this really confusing diagram, but all it does, it's not a separate thing. It's just a graphical representation of both of these factors. So rate coding and size principle coming together to generate uh, specific amounts of forces. They don't happen separately. They all, they all sort of blend together uh, when extra force is required. So if you look at the horizontal axis, if you look at the voluntary force, when more force is required, we get even more motor neurons that are being recruited. And those are represented by the, the sort of dots that are shown in this diagram, the little black dots. Um, and this is what is basically the size principle. Remember, we go from small motor units to large motor units. In the vertical axis, we've got the firing rate. And as you can guess, this is going to be the concept of rate coding. So the more force I need, the firing rate of even the small and the large motor units will be increased. And both of these together give us the firing profile. That's the combination of rate coding and neuron recruitment. So if you imagine sort of like if I'm standing, that's going to require less of these two factors. But if I'm jumping or running, both of these factors are going to increase in turn to give me uh, extra force and extra control in complex activities. Okay, so that's what this diagram is basically showing. Finally, just uh, like this section shouldn't take too long because it is very much revision from your anatomy in semester one, but they do go into a bit about the properties of different muscles. There are four functions and also four properties. The functions, these are not things you need to remember. Like there's no exam question that'll ask you about the properties of muscles, but it's good for you to think about muscles as being things that are not just you know, helping you move around. They also have these little niche functions that help uh, other body processes to occur. The main one that I can think about is generating heat. So we don't normally think about muscles as being things that generate heat, but a lot of the body heat, apart from, you know, digesting food and things actually does come from your movements. So if you think about you sitting in a cold environment and your body just so, sort of starts to shake and twitch a lot, 
That's because it's trying to generate some excess heat from the energy of contractions and relaxations. Okay, other things include just uh, MSK related things. So facilitating movement, posture, body position, stabilizing the joints, et cetera. The four properties are a bit more important. So we have, I won't read over these because I think we might be going over time, but excitability, um, like it's able to receive stimuli. Contractility is able to sort of contract and, and uh, move around when it's stimulated. Extensibility is kind of the opposite. It's able to then relax again and stretch back to what it originally was so we can keep reusing it. And elasticity is again, the recoil. So it goes back to its resting length. So they're all very interrelated, sort of in a very specific order. You don't need to remember the terms at all, but it's important to understand. And then finally, again, everything will be covered in semester one anatomy. So if you wanna look back on those slides from, from PS Platypus, feel free. Uh, we have skeletal muscle, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. Of course, in MSK, we're focusing on skeletal muscle. You will come across a lot of smooth muscle and cardiac muscle when you go over cardiovascular system. So we won't discuss that now, but major features of skeletal muscle are if you look at the histology slides and at, at the sort of microscopic level, all the fibers will be in parallel. And that's what allows us to have sort of directional movement. So we can contract in specific directions. They're all striated and we'll go into why they're striated. Or I think we would have gone over it why they're striated last semester. Um, and they're involved in voluntary movement. So your brain can actually sort of control all this stuff um, consciously. And finally, each cell contains many, many nuclei uh, because of the, the requirements for energy that are involved. And those nuclei are located in the periphery. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but you can sort of see these dense purple um, nuclei that are located around the edges of all the fibers, which is sort of different to smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, which I won't go into so much now, okay? That's pretty much it for your introduction. Um, let me know if you have any questions in the chat. I think this is a fairly straightforward topic, but again, some of the terminology might be a bit new. Um, so if there's anything, please let me know, but I might hand it off to uh, Jano for musculoskeletal history taking. Yep, great. So I'll just start screen sharing and we'll get started with musculoskeletal history taking. All right, is my screen visible for everyone? Yep. Perfect. So we're basically going to be going through the semester two of clinical skills, which I hope will be your favorite topic for the semester, because unlike with anatomy and physiology, there won't be too much linking with how to actually interact with the patient and figure out what's going on with them. In this topic, we're going to be talking about how we can actually go from taking general questions from our semester with history taking and then adding on some more detailed questions to figure out what could be going on with their muscles and even their bones. So we'll start off with, first of all, some context. What is um, a systems review? Because this whole uh, set of slides is about systems reviews. They're basically an additional step in our medical history taking process, which allows us to figure, more about, uh, figure out more about the systems that can be affected by a particular condition that the patient might have. So you already know that uh, whenever you're meeting a patient for a medical history, you're gonna have an introduction, talk to them, get some consent, confidentiality, um, discuss all those details with them and get some basic identifying details from them as well, including the occupation and things like that. And then you move on to the history of presenting complaint, where you talk about what their presenting complaint is and grab a little bit of information about that, the, the where, the when, the quantity, quality, and so on and so forth, and the beliefs, impacts, concerns, expectations. But now we're going to introduce a separate component, which is going to hopefully um, get some more detail about what could be affected uh, in a patient who has a musculoskeletal issue. And so with systems review, we're going to be asking questions which are much more specific than earlier, and they're going to be specific to body systems. And then once we finish that, we're going to be talking about the rest of the medical history with you know, past medical history, family medical history, so on and so forth. Um, and just to give you a bit of, I guess, uh, a clue about what's going to be going on with year one and year two, in your first year, you're going to be learning about systems to do with musculoskeletal system, nervous system, cardiovascular system. Um, but in second year, you're going to be learning a lot more onto that. Um, and when you learn all these different systems, you're going to be then have this ability to be able to ask different questions that can narrow down your diagnosis. And so you're going to go from asking very vague questions in semester one to hopefully figuring out in a bit more detail what's actually going on with the patient. Um, and yep, so the purpose for this whole uh, systems review is asking these additional questions when you suspect the particular system is affected. 
So you would only ask a musculoskeletal system review if you think there is something going on with that. You wouldn't really ask it uh, unless you wanted to be very sure um, that you wouldn't really ask it for any other reason, really. And you're asking very closed questions. So you're not um, having open questions where there's a lot of room for discussion. You're usually asking questions like, do you have any pain? Do you have swelling? So very closed yes or no type questions. And then you can ask them more about descriptions of that uh, a bit later on as well. You're trying to screen for particular symptoms and then link those symptoms with a diagnosis. So we'll talk about how that will happen later on. But in terms of the general process, what initially happens is you, know, you have your history of symptom complaints. So for example, your patient might have shoulder pain. And then from there, you might start developing a little bit of an idea of what's going wrong. So whenever someone has shoulder pain, you might think, what's affected? Is it the bones, the muscles, the ligaments, the bursae, the nerves, anything else? But of course, just knowing that the shoulder pain isn't going to get you any definitive answer, which is why the systems review questions are going to build on that and narrow down your diagnoses. And hopefully you'll end up with something which is a lot more refined and you won't have one particular answer, but you'll at least have a shorter list which you can work from and by doing investigations or other things from there. So in terms of the history, what you're gonna be asking for muscle cellular history, which is gonna be the same for your upper limbs and lower limbs is asking about pain. So things like, have you been experiencing any pain recently? Then you're doing the WWQQAA and advice for that. Um, and then you'll ask about swelling. So you'll ask if you have, have you noticed any swelling around the joint, stiffness, um, asking about stiffness around the joint. In particular, you wanna ask with stiffness, when is that stiffness getting worse? Because it's particularly important with arthritis to ask, uh, do you have morning stiffness? And if you're trying to figure out if it's osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, you'll normally find the patient says that osteoarthritis becomes better with movement. And also that with osteoarthritis, it normally lasts for about 30 minutes or less in the morning. Whereas rheumatoid arthritis is something which lasts for an hour or more in the morning and takes quite a while to, I guess, uh, become a bit more, more sort of easily movable with that joint. You also want to ask about loss of uh, motion. You don't want to use those words there again because they're a bit of medical jargon. You want to ask, can you tell me about how it's impacting your movement? So asking very understandable questions like that. You ask about loss of function as well. So is there anything that you're not no longer able to do with your hands or legs or is more difficult to do with loss of function? Um, with deformity, again, you don't want to use that word there because it can be a little bit offensive. You want to say, does it look a little bit different? Has it changed in appearance? You want to ask about weakness as well in that area. So you might say, has it made your hands or fingers feel weak? Do you feel like you've lost strength? For example, they might not be able to open a, a jar anymore, or they might not be able to grip things or lift things anymore. So that's sort of what weakness is alluding to. Instability. Instability is also, uh, you're asking, do you feel like your knees are giving way? Does it feel like your arm is going to come out of its socket? Things like that. Changes in sensation, you want to ask, have you had any changes in the sensation? Like, uh, and you want to maybe quantify that or give more uh, description for that. Say, have you had any numbness there? Any uh, pins or needles there? And sort of word your questions that way so that's understandable for the patient so they can have a frame of reference to go against. And then you want to ask about systemic features, which are things like fever, fatigue, and weight loss. So you might just ask, have you generally felt unwell at all? And then if they say yes, maybe, or no, even, ask about have you had any fevers recently, any weight loss recently, or any fatigue recently. And again, you can memorize this in any way you want to really, but if you want a mnemonic, um, here's a quick one that I put together um, yesterday. Basically, you want to remember pain and the two S's, swelling and stiffness, so PS2. And then you want to remember the losses of motion and function, so the L there, deformities um, is important, and weakness is also important. And then you want to uh, remember to include the instability changes in sensation systemic features there as well. Uh, and if you're ever stuck about how to actually phrase what you're saying to the patient, I've also got this little slide up here, which you can refer to. Uh, it's sort of trying to avoid medical jargon. So it's trying to avoid using those terms that are given there of pain and swelling and stiffness and loss of motion and trying to put them into more easy to understand terms for patients who are coming in to try and describe uh, what they have. Finally, uh, in terms of additional considerations, you also want to keep in mind that you, you want to ask a couple more questions to the patient that can help you figure out um, a bit, bit better, I guess, what's going on with them. So one thing is handedness. For example, um, if you figure out that a patient is right-handed and they've injured their right arm, it's probably due to some sort of trauma they might have done with their right arm or some sort of movement they've done with the right arm, the dominant arm. Whereas if it's in the opposite arm, maybe it's not so much to do with that. 
Mechanism of injury obviously is going to be very important. Um, usually when you're asking about pain, you want to ask in that same area, when did the pain first start and what were you doing around that time to figure out was some sort of um, athletic injury. So overhead athletes might have bursitis or something else, some sort of trauma that led to the um, pain they're having now. And then finally, you want to ask about occupations and hobbies. Again, sports is very common with musculoskeletal injuries, but other occupations where it's very um, labor intensive can also result in musculoskeletal injuries. And so you also want to figure that out. You usually ask that much earlier on in identifying details when you introduce yourself to the patient. Um, but again, if you ever miss that, always come back to it and ask them more about their occupation. What sort of movements will it involve? Have they injured themselves recently at their work? Um, and yeah, that's sort of what you would be going for with musculoskeletal history. Um, and if you have any questions about that at all, feel free to ask that in the chat. Otherwise, I'll hand it over to the next presenter. Um, thank you, Shangel. I was just share my screen. <clears throat> uh, can you hear my voice clearly? Because the internet connection is, here is a bit flaggy. It sounds good to me. Okay. So. Um, so now we're going to talk about population health. Um, population, before we start, population health is part of um, uh, public health, like in, in first semester, uh, we learned uh, HKS, and this is a semester we're going to uh, learn uh, population health. Um, population health, um, like some students might struggle with it, or um, it, it's not difficult at all, but uh, it might be a little bit boring. <laughs> Um, but uh, you better uh, like it because um, public health, uh, you will learn public health in every semester, every year, until you uh, graduate uh, from mid school. Um, so before we start, um, here's a, a bit of terminology. Um, uh, first of all, health. Health can be defined as state of complete physical, mental, and social uh, well-being, and not merely the absence of disease on or infirmity. If infirmity, um, and in order for us to define population health or what's the purpose of population health, um, so we have three purposes. Um, first of all, um, it improves health um, and it reduces health inequalities. Finally, it focuses on the entire population rather than individuals. Um, so population health is about uh, data uh, and analyzing this data, using this data to solve um, health uh, problems. Um, and population health consists of two parts or two important tools. We have epidemiology and biostatistics. Epidemiology is the study of the disease or the study of the distribution and determinants of health and disease in populations. And um, using this distribution um, to solve health problems. And the other part is biostatics, which is the data ana analysis around all of this, around uh, epidemiology. Um, today, we're gonna focus more on epidemiology or the first part of population health. And um, in next, uh, in upcoming weeks, uh, we will go through biostatistics, statistics, sorry. Um, and we're gonna start by talking about causation. Um, or the causes of, of uh, diseases. So causation is something that um, either alone or in combination with other things can produce an outcome, and in this case, uh, diseases. And uh, it's very important 
um, when we study population health to, to know the causation or uh, in order to um, analyze the data. Uh, because when we know the, or determine the cause of uh, diseases, we can prevent these diseases. Um, we can uh, choose the correct diagnosis for them uh, as well as treating them uh, pretty well. And uh, we have two terms when we talk about causation or causes. We have sufficient cause and necessary cause. Um, um, it might be tricky, like uh, sometimes uh, I get confused between the two terms, but with some examples, um, things will be clarified more. So sufficient cause means um, the uh, factors that when they are present, present uh, uh, they are enough to result in a disease. Like the presence of this factor is enough to result in disease. Uh, however, necessary cause, like um, disease never present when this factor is absent. So um, when this factor is not present, the disease must not be present uh, also. Um, so for example, you have uh, TB, tuberculosis, so um, the exposure to the bacteria, the mycobacterium tuberculosis is necessary uh, for this disease. Like uh, no one can get tuberculosis without uh, being exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis. But is it uh, sufficient for the disease? Does, like, does the, expose, the exposure uh, sufficient for the disease uh, to be occurred, um, it's not. So uh, the exposure to mycobacterium tuberculosis is necessary, but not sufficient because um, lots of people might be exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis, but they not develop uh, the disease because um, probably their immune system um, is not poor or weak. Um, <coughs> Sorry. Another example, uh, smoking. Uh, smoking is not necessary nor sufficient uh, for the development of lung cancer. Lots of people have lung cancer and have never smoked uh, before. Um, also another example, Ebola, where um, the cause um, of Ebola fever is Ebola virus. So Ebola virus is necessary and sufficient cause. Of Ebola virus. Another example is Down syndrome. Um, having one more 21 chromosome is necessary and sufficient cause to get Down syndrome. And then we have <coughs> Bradford uh, Hill criteria um, for causation. Um, we have seven uh, criteria. Um, and the most important one and the one we need to focus on is temporality. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, uh, when we consider the causation, um, the cause must become before the effect, like the cause of the disease must, be, must become before the disease in order to consider this, uh, this is a causation, it must be, become before the effect. So the temporality means, does the cause precede the effect or come before the effect? Um, and the other things we can figure out from its name. So uh, plausibility is the association was consistent with existing uh, knowledge. Then we have uh, consistency, have similar results been shown in other studies. Uh, strength, the strength of this association um, between the cause and the effect, uh, dose response increasing, does increasing the cause um, increase the effect and uh, reversibility, the removal of the cause, uh, does cause the removal of the effect or decreasing the effect. And finally, strength of the study design. We have uh, <coughs> many uh, types of study um, designs. And these study designs determines the strength. Uh, we'll go through study designs, I think, in week four. And um, we have them 
here for like um the most uh like strength um the best um studies that can be used as evidence are meta-analysis and randomized control trial as you can see here then we have a risk uh, factors. So um, most of the diseases around the world have uh, more than one cause, and therefore we refer to these causes as risk um, factors. <coughs> like um, I think it was seventy percent, more than seventy percent of deaths around the world caused by. Uh, non-communicable diseases like hypertension, um, diabetes, uh, high blood uh, sugar, uh, and uh, high cholesterol. And all of these are preventable diseases like by um, some simple changes in lifestyle, for example, we can prevent these uh, um, non-communicable diseases from uh, happening or at least control these non-communicable diseases. So yeah, it's very important to know the risk factors of this disease in order to control um, um, these uh, diseases. And then we will um, get less, uh, much lower um, deaths around the world. So risk factors can be defined as factors that are associated with disease, but not uh goes like a number of these risk factors might cause um or increase the chances of getting these diseases and they can be predisposing uh, like age genes sex previous infections um uh, like um some disease might go just in females or in males um enabling or disabling low income poor nutrition inadequate access to healthcare. Uh, we have precipitating risk factors, uh, exposure to a disease agent, and finally reinforcing um, risk factors through repeated exposure, environmental conditions, or physical stress. And now we'll go to the math thing. Um, so we use this um, assessment or risk factor assessments um, help us to determine um, a number of things about, to figure out a number of things about these uh, diseases, the percentage um, of the affected population, um, how much risk uh, like a certain population have this uh, disease. So, um, I think you need just to know the formula of this uh, um, <coughs> um, of this risk, uh, relative risk or attributable risk, attributable uh, risk fraction, population attributable risk, and population attributable attributable uh, risk uh, person. Because and uh, also you need to know um, what does this give me like. Uh, uh, what does risk mean or relative risk mean? How can we use it uh, in analysis, uh, in data analysis? Um, so risk is the number of events divided by number of people at risk, can include time in a certain uh, population. Uh, relative risk is uh, the risk in exposed population divided by risk in unexposed population. Uh, population. Uh, attributable uh, risk is the difference between um, uh, risk in exposed population and risk in unexposed population. Attributable fraction is attributable risk divided by risk in uh, exposed population and multiplied by 100 uh, percent. So the, the difference between risk in exposed and risk unexposed divided by risk uh, in exposed. Um, population attributable risk is the difference between total population risk and risk in unexposed population 
And finally, we have the population attributable uh, risk percent, which is the population attributable risk divided by total population risk and uh, multiplied by 100%. You just need to know these formulas. Um, and I think in the exams, because it will be multiple choice questions and uh, you won't, uh, you can't have a calculator during the exam. Um, these numbers or these uh, questions will be just ready for you and they might ask you um, about the groups or what does this percent uh, or this number tell us. Um, then we have two um, terms, incidence and prevalence. Um, uh, and like we might get confused uh, between them. Um, but uh, as we go, as you go through um, your study and uh, apply them, especially in ICLs, uh, you'll get the difference between uh, the two terms. So incidence is the rate of occurrence of new cases in a given uh, period in a specified population. So it's uh, incidence means then just the new cases of a certain disease or certain condition uh, during a specific period of time in a specific population. And uh, it, uh, it's used to measure acute conditions and one with high mortality rates. Some uh, also, it might also be called uh, the attack rate. And the population uh, size may change in this period of time. However, prevalence is the frequency of existing cases in a defined population at a given uh, period of time. So the difference between incidence and prevalence, incidence is the number of new cases or the number of people who develop this condition or disease. Uh, however, prevalence is the number of uh, the or the frequency of people who already has the disease in a certain um, time. And it's useful uh, to measure chronic conditions. Finally, we have some further measures uh, can use um, measuring disease. Um, mortality, uh, which, is, which means death, and it's a measure of the number of deaths in a population uh, period of time. We have uh, case fatality, uh, which is deaths within a particular disease. So um, number of uh, deaths of these particular diseases divided by the number of people affected by this disease. Uh, we have morbidity, which is a measure of who is living with the disease or who has the disease. Um, and finally, we have, we have personies, which is a measure of time at risk for all people that contributed um, to this study. Uh, this one is used in studies um, to help analysis the data. And that's all I have today. Thank you so much and I hope everything was clear. Thanks, Mark. Um, all right, uh, let's very, very briefly smash through my three slides of positive psychology, as long as my computer doesn't crash. And if it does, I'll ask someone else to screen share. Uh, or we'll just get out of this because, goodness, it's been a long one. Uh, and apologies for that. All right. OK, positive psychology, uh, it's pretty low yield. Uh, so don't worry about it too much. Um, it's mostly just for yourself. Um, there are a few little things to know, but it's mostly just like Ideas to help you not go completely insane when looking at the amount of anatomy content per week or whatever. Um, okay, so positive psych is a, an approach that started in the 90s, um, and it, it's studying what enables uh, people by themselves and as groups to thrive. Um, it, however, it's like it's not cohesive, it's not complete, and it isn't actually considered or marketed as like an, an, a replacement. Um, something to take place of 
uh, other mental health approaches. It's just su sort of supplementary. Okay, so key idea, uh, mental health. Uh, so that's the state of well-being. When someone's able to realize their abilities, cope with the normal stresses of life, they will, can work productively and they can make contributions to their own community. That's basically the definition. Um, and sort of the uh, contrary to that is uh, mental illness, although that's not all of it. Um, and you'll see in the next couple of slides um, what I mean by that. But yeah, so the absence of mental illness doesn't guarantee optimal health, the same way that the absence of illness doesn't guarantee health as a whole. Um, and negativity bias is an important thing to consider so that we can sort of be aware of it and combat it. Um, and that's the idea that uh, we want to, um, we, we have an evolutionary uh, prerogative for whole feeling losses and negative events um, much more heavily, uh, much more strongly um, then we do ex experiencing relatively equivalent positive events. So losing $5 feels substantially worse. Um, I think there's a Veritasium video that says that it's about twice, feels about twice as bad. So losing $5 feels as good as maybe gaining 10, feel, feels as bad as gaining $10 feels good. It's a bit hard to uh, articulate, but... Basically, we hold on to negative things more, so it's important to be aware of and try and combat. Um, well-being, roughly equivalent to the concept of happiness. Uh, well-being is subject subjective, and you can't, just because someone looks like they're doing well, doesn't necessarily mean that they are doing well. Um, hedonia versus eudaimonia, so that's the hedonic versus eudaimonic um, well-being um, that we discussed, or, or joy, or those sorts of things that we discussed last semester. Um, so hedonia is that idea of sort of joy seeking, sex, drugs, and rock and roll kind of vibe. Um, it's not great, especially in the long term, for sort of trying to find long term pleasure because um, it's sort of this just going for dopamine hits, um, and can you know some aspects of it can potentially even be self destructive. Um, whereas eudaimonia, that's the well being from meaning, um, and that's good. That's that's what we want. So trying to find sort of purpose, meaning, those sorts of things, they help us. Um, yes. All right. So for optimal well-being, this is a life pro tip. Um, get frequent daily hits of positive emotions. So hopefully from a sort of constructive or productive uh, sort of outlet. But yeah, so one of the best ways is through social connection, but the classics. So tuning in that sort of mindfulness, moving your body, exercising, um, going for a walk, connecting with others, especially during lockdown, very important to still not break lockdown, but uh, reach out to people and make sure that you're talking to another human being in one way or another every day. Um, be curious, be open to things, those sorts of mindfulness, um, self-compassion kind of ideas and eating and sleeping well as much as you can. Um, it does legitimately help. And this is our final bit, it's mental illness in it. Um, so really we've got this sort of spectrum um, and we have the concept of well-being and mental illness symptoms or mental illness um, as it's presenting. So really, if you have low well-being and high mental illness, that's considered complete mental illness. Um, and that's, or well, that is a complete mental illness. And that's um, where, that, that's the group that is the most disadvantaged. Um, whereas complete mental health is not only not uh, or, or sort of managing mental illness symptoms so that you have low mental illness symptoms, but it's also ensuring that you have that more holistic well-being. Um, thank you. Take care of yourselves. Uh, yeah, lots of love. Yeah. Thanks so much to Kyle and everyone else who presented today. And thank you to you guys for sticking around uh, because that was a very long one. <laughs> um, we'll try and keep them uh, much shorter than that in the future, obviously, um, but at the start of the term it being you know, just like getting back to the groove of things. Um, and also anatomy being a really big fat topic. Um, those are both gonna potentially you know, push us longer. Um, so we'll try and keep that a bit shorter. Um, anatomy will probably potentially um, stay long because it's just a big fat topic. Um, we'll try and cut everything else down and, and try to make things brief and, and fairly efficient. Um, so, but thank you for sticking around. It's a really long one. Um, if you left earlier and you're now catching up on YouTube, hi, I don't blame you. Um, and Again, admin stuff real quick, uh, we'll put out a poll or something. We'll try and figure out the scheduling um, so that you guys can go to your um, 
your muddiest point um, and still come to this. Or if it turns out none of you care about muddiest point, we'll maybe keep the same spot, we'll figure it out. Um, and yeah, uh, remember to send questions through Curious Chat. Um, thank you so much. We'll see you next week.